Bonjour tout le monde, je m'appelle David Cormier, je viens de l'île du Prince-Édouard, je suis à l'université de l'île du Prince-Édouard. Et aujourd'hui, je veux vous parler des MOOC. Je vais parler en anglais, mais je voulais vous euh, dire bonjour en français. Euh, merci de m'avoir invité à la mois de la pédagogie, pédagogie universitaire. Et puis aujourd'hui, on va parler des MOOC. Euh, comment on a commencé avec euh, parler des MOOC en 2008? Puis uh, après ça, on va regarder un peu au futur aussi. So, um, my name is, uh, you know, I'm Dave Cormier. I'm manager of web communications and innovations at the University of Prince Edward Island. And uh, I also have been doing a fair amount of work online in education, online learning, trying to push the boundaries of some of the things that are possible. And I think primarily looking at the internet from the point of view of what it can do rather than for education rather than what we can do to translate what we do with education now to the internet. So trying to find the basic premises of the internet, the things that it can do where its um, affordances are, and seeing where we can translate those things into things that are useful. So when we look at MOOCs, uh, obviously we've been doing different kinds of open courses for a long time, different forms of widening participation, ways in which we've been trying to make lots and lots of people, give lots and lots of people access to learning, whether that be with TV learning, whether that be with, you know, open forum discussions, you know, Michel Foucault had 2,000 people come out to see him at La Salbonne when he was there speaking. So there have been lots of ways of doing this, and certainly even in the last 10 or 15 years we've had people do a variety of different things. But MOOC so-called, um, the first one that was actually called that was in 2008. I coined the term in a discussion the summer before it started um, because what was being done by George Siemens and Stephen Downs at the time was a course where they had 25 people locally who were paid to take a course at the University of Manitoba and then they opened it up to everyone else and 2300 people came and I think there's something different about that many people doing the same thing at the same time and that was it seemed important and, and seemed important enough to actually call it something specific so between 2008 and 2010 2011 I participated, um, helped facilitate maybe five or six different MOOCs. We ran a whole bunch of different ones. We tried a lot of different things. And then in the fall of 2011, uh, there was a course done at Stanford, the Stanford AI course, and 165,000 people came out to that course. And that really was the, the watershed moment, I think, for MOOCs, where all of a sudden they became things that people knew about, where it started getting into the media. People started talking about this revolution that was happening in education, which was really just an online course that lots of people were coming to, which for most of us doesn't seem like an innovation, particularly as we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, but I think the numbers make it different, and certainly its impact on the strategic planning of institutions has been, has been really profound. Uh, and I really think that's just, you know, as much as anything, it's universities starting to understand some of the potential that is inherent in the way the internet is structured. So just uh, in order to help maybe structure some of this conversation, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what a MOOC actually is, uh, at least from my perspective, and certainly <laughs> there are others out there. But um, for me, in, in coining the term, what I was looking at, where, where I thought the words were important. So the word massive, and you know, some people say, well, what's the difference? You have a small open course. I think having lots and lots of people doing something makes it different. I think scale is different. And you know, it gives you a potential of having a much wider people, or a much wider group of people to choose from, a much more, um, more potential for networking opportunities, more potential to have people with vastly different perspectives, particularly when you're talking internationally, having people from different cultures who have different socioeconomic backgrounds, it really, it widens that group of people. And I think there's something really important about that. Um, openness, I see in kind of two frames. One of them is openness in terms of widening participation, openness in terms of allowing people in the door, letting, giving people access to knowledge that wouldn't have it for other reasons, whether they don't, you know, wouldn't have the financial um, resources to be able to buy their way into a course or whether or not they wouldn't have the time or the flexibility or whatever that happens to be. So I think widening particip participation is a really important part of openness. And openness also in terms of transparency and in terms of the process from the creator, from the facilitator's point of view. So both openness in terms of allowing the students to control and also openness from the facilitator's um, 
delivery standpoint from uh, openness and access to information, openness and access to the material that's part of that course. Uh, online almost seems redundant, I guess, to some degree, but I think it's still important to talk about it because it is that fundamental difference of the internet that makes the MOOC possible. You know, all the connections that can happen and also the analytics that are possible. This is a, an analytic sort of snapshot of my Facebook account and it really maybe illustrates some of the potential data that can be collected from doing these massive sort of people gatherings and some of the positives and negatives that are possible when we talk, talk about learning analytics and I think that the MOOC certainly allows analytics to be brought to bear. So if you have 100,000 people doing something, there's a lot you can tell about general patterns by tracking the way things they click on, the choices they make, and how they succeed or don't succeed. Uh, and the course is, is another one of those things that has been often debated. Why are we calling it a course? Isn't it just the internet? Why aren't we talking about a community? And I think that it being a course is a really important distinction. Uh, communities go on forever. I've managed a community for years. They're hard. They're hard to keep going. They take a lot of effort. With a course, you know when you're starting. You know when you're ending. You know how much time you're committing to it. And it also it applies a lot more structure. So with a course that starts on the 26th of April, and we have a course uh, starting here on Facebook on 26th of April called Experience U, um, it is it allows people to know when it starts. Everybody starts at the same time, so you start on an even space, which with a community doesn't always happen, and you know how much time you're going to be committing to that thing, and I think that that's also important too. Um, in looking at MOOCs and looking at two examples, they, they tend to come in different kinds of flavors. People have talked about them as X MOOCs or C MOOCs, and C is for connectivist, and that's sort of the underlying theory that started those first MOOCs that I talked about earlier. Um, but I, I do think that they don't tend to come in different flavors. This is a more C MOOC like course. Um, this one ended a couple months ago. It's called Ed C MOOC. It was on Coursera platform. I don't think the platforms much matter in terms of whether or not they're C's or X's. But in this one, all the all the content is open content. Um, it was very much designed for collaboration and interaction, and not about those 10 people over there remembering those 10 important points. And I really think that that old school approach is really what most people mean when they talk about XMOOC. So an XMOOC is, here's this video, watch this video, answer this quiz. A CMOOC is really more about creating connections and network connections and, and collective understanding. So this is a CMOOC style uh, where you see you've got uh, lots of discussion forums and if you dug into those discussion forums you'd see there's lots of people coming to know and coming to understand together. Whereas an XMOOC is more about you know here's a horse thing and here's how many teeth it has and do you know how many teeth it has and it doesn't really involve a lot of interaction. It doesn't necessarily require it. Its purpose is not to build network connections but rather to give people access to specific kinds of information and maybe allow themselves to test that on that. Um, I think both of those are, are valuable. I think they apply to different kinds of situations. I think there are lots of things that I would like to do an XMOOC on just to find out a few basic facts about it. I think that I prefer the idea of a CMOOC. I, I love the idea of learning being uh, creating connections between people and the community really being the curriculum and that's that's really important to me. So those distinctions are helpful. I don't think it's a matter of saying one is better or worse but rather that they apply to different things. Um, the last point that I want to talk about is where the idea of MOOC brings us to and I think you know we talked about how it's impacting the strategic planning of a lot of higher educational institutions I think that's if nothing else it's happening I mean there's no way to ignore it at this point um, you know we see institutions who are throwing all of their budgets uh, their online budgets into these MOOC things and we see some institutions like the one we just showed both of those are from the University of Edinburgh who I think really have a practical approach they're offering short free courses and they're looking to attract those students to come in and take other online courses paid online courses later on so some people are doing some crazy dramatic things and some people are doing some simple ones I'd like to talk about two um, simple cases in terms of the future I'm sure lots of others would occur to you one of them is the threat that the MOOC presents to universities that depend on large classrooms to pay for things. If you have 500 biology students in Biology 101 and each of those students is paying a thousand bucks a piece, 
that's five hundred thousand dollars that the institution has made for one class. So those those bigger courses pay for the smaller courses at a lot of institutions. So, you know, when you only have twenty people in a classroom or ten, you know, the institution's not making nearly as much money per class. And those things tend to balance each other out, which is fine. But if a student has a choice of taking a MOOC that somehow gets accredited and they can show up whenever they want and maybe it's cheaper and there's certainly been some intimation that that might happen, I think there's a real significant threat to the bottom line of some higher educational institutions there. I think on the flip side, there's some really great opportunity for widening participation, particularly in the third world, particularly opening it up via cell phone and stuff, and for really making the idea of learning lifelong and often and repeated and in different subjects a lot more open to a lot of people whenever you take the MOOC approach. There are lots of other things, lots of other future potentials, but I've tried to stay under 10 minutes and I hope you guys have a really great conference. Take care. My name's, again, you want to get a hold of me, at Dave Cormier. I'll see you on Twitter. Cheers.